Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Southeastern Sports Network podcast. I'm Robbie Rose. Happy to be with you for another week here. Is this uh, this is week 10, Mark? Is that right? I'm it is deep week 10. This can't, can't believe it, but finally here. Week 10 is finally here. That's right. Our special guest segment this week, as always, is brought to you by Gateway Ford and Punch a Tool. And our special guest is Hall of Famer. That's right. Hall of Famer, Larry Heimel, former sports information director for, for such a long time at Southeastern Louisiana University. Uh, we've had we've had some great guests on here so far, uh, and Larry's right up there with him um, with what he's been able to accomplish in his career, not only um, as his time at Southeastern in the sports sports information department, which you know got him in the Hall of Fame, but he's done so much with alumni and former players since getting out of that role. Larry, thanks for being with us uh, today. We really really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Well, it's great to have you. Um, you know. Um, I think so many people know you and, and know what you mean to this school and know what you mean to this university, but um, just tell everybody real quick, we'll start it out with how did you, how did you get to Southeastern in this capacity? And uh, was it the only job you ever had on campus? And, and just tell your history on how you became a lion. Well, first of all, I started at Southeastern as, as a student and I worked in publications as a student worker along with the uh, line drawer. And then uh, I also worked at the daily star while I was going to school and when I graduated, the Daily Star hired me as a sports, a sports director, editor. And then six months later, Southeastern called me and said, do you want to be sports information director? And I said, yes. And so I jumped in there. I did that for 28 years. And then I walked across campus and ran a university center for another 11 and then retired and then worked part time with the alumni, as you mentioned, mostly dealing with X for another 12. So I was I was out here for over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what a great career! What a great uh, testament and legacy you have at this university and to the people that have you've worked with, co- athletes you've covered, and, and and athletes you've helped after they finished school. Um, just, just I, I, you've been around for a long time. Tell us how far in your mind this athletic department and this university and this this community has come since you you know been a student, been a worker, and now uh, in retirement on Southeastern's campus. Well, obviously, with all the technology and everything, it's just it's just blossomed. I mean, tremendously, you know, you know, have video at football games and, and you're going to have it. It's uh, you know, baseball and ball. And, you know, it's just all the technology stuff and the improvements in the stadium they made back in around 72, 73, when they redid the stadium. And then they, uh, then they came back at a press box in the parking garage a little bit later. I think that was under Dr. Moffitt's uh, regime and just all those things just accent. Of course, the, the transformation of, uh, Pat Keneally Field, alumni, uh, alumni field, and uh, what they've done there. The softball complex now has really taken off. And, of course, University Center is a great place for basketball and volleyball, as we know. Mark, go ahead. Well, you know, I, I, I couldn't wait to get you on, Larry. I've uh, been wanting to have you on all year. And you, you are the, the go-to source for uh, Southeastern Athletics. And I know you, you've been a stalwart in the Hammond community, grew up here and went to Hammond High. And, of course, you – as you mentioned, uh, started your career at Southeastern, never left. You've been, you've been a lifer, so to speak, and uh, a two-time Hall of Famer. I know that. So uh, Southeastern Thank Hall you. of Fame, also the state of Louisiana Hall of Fame, which, as you know, very hard to get into. So uh, uh, certainly a feather and one of the very few uh, Southeastern um, alums in the Louisiana Hall of Fame. So I want to get that out there also. But uh, let's step back to you know, the beginning of your Southeastern career. Uh, what, what was the first year you were a student here? What year was that? Started in the summer of 60. Right after I graduated, walked across, across town and uh, and started here as a student. And you were working at the Daily Star, I believe, at the same time, right, as a sports editor, as you mentioned. Yes. And Especially in the summer. I had a full, I say, a full-time job in the summer there. Uh, didn't go to summer school very often. And, uh, and then during the fall and the spring, I doubled up on both as best I could. So you go way back to uh, Stan Galloway and his tenure <laughs> as a head football coach toward the end of his, his career. But just talk about Stan Galloway and uh, Coach Galloway and Southeastern back then. I know they, I think, 60 and 61, uh, one loss in each of those years, had a chance to win the conference championship in both years. But uh, just go back to, you know, that beginning and talk about football back under Stan Galloway. Well, I was very small when I started off. As you mentioned, we were nine and one in 1960 and nine and one in 1961. And uh, that spoiled me right there, 18 and two. But Galloway was a good coach. I mean, he did everything that you had to do to produce a program. 
and he maintained it throughout his career. The the players uh, was a love hate relationship, you know, with him, but uh, they respect him. They played hard for him, and um, it's just he brought in some. He had some good talent back in those days. Uh, really good talent. And uh, obviously, football not the only sport on campus. Uh, you also have. Uh, basketball, baseball, and all that. And in Southeastern, you know, a lot of people don't realize, even though football uh, gets the lion's share of the, of the ink and that sort of thing, but Southeastern's had success in all sports going back to the 50s. And uh, just talk about that, if you would. I know basketball back in the Dick Sharp days, and, of course, uh, also baseball under Pat Keneally. Just talk about other sports, if you, if you would. Well, you mentioned basketball with Dick Sharp. Uh, that was in the 50s. They went all the way to the NAI quarterfinals one year, and Dick was named to the ES Liston Award for the Outstanding Junior Basketball Player in the Country, and he lived up to it. And then, uh, of course, that was 50s, and pretty good, but that was the best of times. And went and played Bebo Francis, who was leading the nation in scoring with about 60 points a game, believe it or not. And we actually wound up beating them in the uh, – NAIA tournament, and then uh, we lost in overtime in the regionals. Well, Spivo and Francis, then, one of the one of the all time great names in college basketball. <laughs> it has to be after as much as he did. I think he averaged more than Pistol Pete did. That's that's quite an accomplishment, and uh, you know, just over your time, we've seen the growth of this athletic department, and obviously women's athletics uh, becoming a, a part of southeastern lore and southeastern athletics. Talk about the rise of women athletics. You know, especially I know it grew to dominance in the 70s with basketball, but just talk about that evolution, if you would. Well, they brought in women's athletics, uh, I think it was, what, 74, 75. And, of course, the first four or five years, Southeastern just dominated in women's basketball. Linda Puckett came in. She had some very good players, obviously. Uh, some of them like Queen Brumfield, who's in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. And then uh, there's four or five of them that's in the Southeastern uh, Athletic Hall of Fame that was on that 76-77 uh, team that won a national championship. And many of us believe if Sarah Williams hadn't got hurt the next year in the, in the uh, regionals, that we'd have probably had back-to-back -back championships. And um, then, of course, you mentioned the 70s. You go back to the track team won the NAIA championship in 1975, and the baseball team went to the Division II World Series in uh, 75. Uh, 70, yeah, 75. They're both of them at the same time. And But women's athletics just grew from there, and we dominated. At one time, we'd won 44 straight games over the Louisiana competition in women's basketball. And still wow. on Puckett's uh, – when she left, I think she still had a winning record over both LSU and Louisiana Tech, which were both starting to come into more prominence at that time. I know, I know you, you just mentioned LSU, and I know Southeastern at one time had won 8 of 11 or whatever it was. And I know LSU's coming in here in, in about uh, two or three weeks. They'll be playing here at the University Center, ranked number one. And uh, we, we've asked when was the last time a number one team came to Hammond to play at, at, at Southeastern. And you have to go back to 78 when LSU came here ranked number one. Uh, played at the, the old Cephalu Coliseum in front of a packed house. And uh, so this is a, a, a rivalry that goes back to the 70s, and they were a rival at one time because they all played together in the state of Louisiana. Right. And, of course, we won the state championship for about four or five straight years and went on to the regionals. And then they divided it between basically Division One and Division Two, and uh, we dominated the Division Two portion of it. But we still, like I said, the first four or five years, we just dominated the state no matter who you were. And you, and you you mentioned briefly, uh, you know, men's baseball back in the '70s, Greg Martin's tenure when as a player, and uh, yeah. I guess uh, who was the head coach? Was that Coach Torbush? No, that was well, uh, go Bob Ricketts. Bob, Bob Ricketts. came in. Bob and I were good friends, and uh, and then he went out and got some recruiting. Recruited Andy Davis from up in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, brought him down here. Went in New Orleans uh, at that time. Uh, and recruit a bunch of young men from there that, that, you know, that made this, the, the program. And then we, we got in the last second into the NCAA regionals. We were the fourth team picked uh, to go to the uh, regionals, which were in Jacksonville, the host team. And we had to play them the first night. And we were facing a pitcher who was drafted, I think, in the first two rounds, who'd averaged like 17 strikeouts a game during the season. Wow. Narrow it down on it. His 18th strikeout was at the top of the ninth. The bases were loaded. There were two out. All the catcher had to do was step on the plate and end the game. He threw the ball wild at first base. We scored two runs and then got another base hit. Wound up winning that game. Then went on to beat Southern University uh, uh, twice to win the, uh, the regional championship. Wow, that's that's uh, quite an accomplishment <laughs> there. And you know, you talked about, of course, 
that kind of led to the success in the nineties under Greg Martin, uh, making a couple of regionals in 92 and 93 and, and that, which led to more success later on under J.R. Teagues and also uh, Matt Riser. But let's step back. You, t- you mentioned track and uh, a national championship in 1975. A lot of people don't realize how dominant Southeastern was in track and field in the 1970s. Oh, gosh, yes. And uh, Larry Crow was the organizer of that. He brought in a lot of really good uh, uh, track and field people. Uh, we went to the NAI championships. We had people like Wayne Hardy, Ralph Smith, Donald Dykes, the Hammond High product, who also went on and played pro football. And those guys were just a uh, nucleus of, of the championship team. And, and we had a great relay team. And actually, you forget the next year after the same season, we won the NAI championship. The next week, we went to the N2 NCAA Division II regionals and finished second. Of course, I think Donald Dykes won a national championship in the long jump, I believe, like 26 feet. So uh, not only a great football player in the NFL, but also great on the track as well. Amen. He was really good. He's probably Larry. Had here. And Larry, you've uh, talked about the legacy of Southeastern in terms of the players, but you have a legacy as a sports information director with guys that have gals that worked under you that have gone on. I mean, how many head SIDs do you have now uh, working out there in the industry today? Uh, I've got uh, a couple that were directly under me. Matt Sullivan's now at UL Lafayette doing a fantastic job there. Jack Duggan at uh, University of Southern Mississippi. And I would have a third one at South Alabama. Matt Smith yeah. who graduated from work. And Matt went to, he finally got his dream job, which was South Alabama. It's what he always wanted to be. And he was like 30, 31 years old, and he died of a heart attack. He would still be there mm-hmm. someday, I'm sure. And I've had wow. some other uh, student assistants that went on to, to, you know, to do good things. A bunch of the young people that worked under me in one form or the other have gone in other successful. One of my student workers is Scotty Nunez, who's actually running the university center right now. I'm very proud of Scotty. That's great. And, you know, we, we know Matt Sullivan really well and a uh, great friend of ours did this for a long time. And then, you know, I mean, Kemmer Chapel, who's the current SID, he, he worked under the guys that worked under you. And so it's all part of the legacy you've created um, here at Southeastern. You know, we, we talked about the good days, Larry, but there were some rough times in the 80s when football went away. Tell, tell us about that time. And just, I mean, uh, everyone knows it left, but tell us about, you know, what it was really like when it left. And how many times did they try to get it back going? Well, the, you know, it was dropped in 85. Dr. J. Larry Crane dropped it for various reasons. And uh, uh, we'll go into that. But anyway, uh, you can read about that in my book. But anyway. We'll talk <laughs> about, we're going to talk about your book in a moment. So, <laughs> Yeah. Dropped, uh, we dropped football in 85. And then they, a couple of years later, they brought in Bob Broadhead, who had some distinguished service at LSU to bring try to revive football. And he did. And I really think Bob's biggest mistake was he was so used to being able to do something as soon as he wanted to and didn't have the patience to really make it happen, you know, which really would have taken. And eventually they disbanded that idea when they found out they couldn't couldn't do it financially the way they wanted to. And then uh, then it just dropped until Dr. Clausen came in in the late 90s as president. And, of course, the first thing she was hit with was uh, – you know, when you're going to bring back football and all she told them is I've got some things on campus I've got to take care of first. And then I'll work to bring back football. And she did. And then, you know, eventually Dr. Moffitt took in right after her and 2003 football came back. And of course, you talked about negativity. We also had that little spurt in there around uh, 87, 88 when we had to drop basketball for one year. Uh, right. And that was, that was <laughs> those 85 to 90 was not the most pleasant year. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, we yeah. talk. Go ahead, go ahead, Robbie. Yeah, I mean, Mark talks about that a lot. That was before my time, but to be a Division One program without women, uh, uh, men, or men's football, or, or 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 men's basketball is just kind of it's unbelievable to think about. And no, and no conference, no well. conference, no conference. Talk about Larry. Um, you know, people know the current rivalries, but like you know, we played Louisiana Tech back in twenty 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 one. I remember you know, thinking like, oh, you know, uh, you know, Tech is uh, a team that is um, obviously part of the state football situation, but Louisiana Tech to guys that played in the 60s and 70s, that's an arch rival, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of what they used to do. Playing well, Southeastern. Excuse me, the early 60s was really the rivalry because we were national rank. Louisiana Tech was national rank. In 1960s, one of the most memorable road games, unfortunately, 
we went up there and uh, they returned a punt on us. We was undefeated. They returned a punt on us late in the ball game to beat us 17-14 and finished up nine and one. And then the mm-hmm. next we we paid them back at homecoming. We uh uh we beat them pretty good. I remember Billy Ladner uh picked up a kickoff and ran it back about 85, 90 yards, and that really set the tone for that ball game. And we beat them. You know, mentioned Tech through the years, of course, Bradshaw, which we beat him when he was a sophomore. He beat us in one of the most electrifying games ever played in Strawberry Stadium in 69. And uh, one trivia question I've always passed out, what do Roger Staubach, Ron Jaworski, and and Terry Bradshaw have in common? And the, the answer on that is they all played in losing games in Strawberry Stadium. That's right. When uh, Roger Staubach, who played at the freshman – because Navy football was you played in Pensacola, Pensacola, right? When they were freshmen, playing with the Pensacola Navy, and we played Pensacola Navy and Quantico Marines, uh, you know, service teams back in those days. You could do that. And he came. We played him over there, and then he came here, and we beat him when they were here. And then uh, Jaworski, of course, was with Youngstown, and uh, we beat him when he was quarterback. And of course, he went on to a lot of fame in the NFL too. So uh, Stallback played in Pensacola for the first year and then went to well, Annapolis from there. Is well, that I think that, that was after he graduated from Navy. He was in the military. And so he was stationed. Oh, okay. He, so he played for that's Pensacola right. Navy. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I understand now. Well, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and lastly, McNeese coming up this week. Uh, talk about the history of that rivalry between these two schools. Well, again, I go back to a big defeat. We were undefeated in the, uh, after we beat Tech and started rolling. We went to McNeese in 61. And they wound up in that. Uh, that was the one loss in 1961. And of course, we've been a proximity close to them. It's always been a, a, a good rivalry in different sports, you know, in football especially. And then uh, basketball, I think, has always been a pretty good one. They've had some pretty good players there through the years that uh, that, that we had to battle with. And and then of course, uh, obviously, baseball uh, is good. And now softball is a big rivalry, you know. Yeah. Are, are the kingpins of softball in Southland Conference right now. And so, you know, that's yeah. a, that right now is pretty hot. I got two more for you, Larry, real quick, and then I'll give it back to Mark. So um, if you could poll all these former players going back from, like, when they dropped football in 85 back to 60, 1960 when you got on campus, so to speak, if you could poll them from a football perspective – I know the Riverville Classic is a great thing, and Nichols is a rival. But who would they who would they categorize if you had to poll them? What would win the poll out for the the biggest rival in those guys' eyes of the football programs that you might face uh, here at Southeastern? Oh, I would say since we started playing Nichols, it would have to be since you went from '85 back. You know, in the '60s it was Tech, but from the time we started playing Nichols on, it was it was Nichols the biggest football rivalry to me. Gotcha. That's great. And most of those would probably agree to that. And then lastly, for me, um, you're obviously in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. People wonder about some of these players that have been here recently. Um, you know, uh, any guys that you see? I mean, I think Wade Miley comes to mind, Robert Alford. Do you see those guys having a potential to get in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame when it's all said and done, uh, when they're up for a vote at one time? That's very hard to say, to be honest with you, because you never know from one year to the next who's in competition and on the ballot. And uh, uh, Wade is pretty close to having some pretty decent numbers. I'm going to get Damon Sunday to run it and compare it with a couple of guys like Russ Springer and, and Paul Bird who were in there and see what they did in a major league career. Uh, Robert had a, a good career, but consider some of the football players that are out there on the ballot right now and hadn't been uh, elected in a few years. He mm-hmm. would fall behind those, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Just, just I think people just wonder, you know, what the criteria is. And then you did a great job kind of understanding because – it's 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 about everybody, right? It's players from all forms of of football um, in the state of Louisiana that have been playing for you know many many years. Oh yeah, not only you know most of them gone to pros, made all pro up there. Uh, there's still there's a couple guys that made all pro that's on the ballot right now that hadn't gotten in, you know. And then you start taking in all these other sports. They, you know, we've we've uh, we brought we've inducted a wrestler, uh, a weightlifter last year, uh, yeah, I which I. Eastern players, Tommy Calandro and uh, Brett Bryan were there because they worked with him and under him, you know. And you just go almost any sport uh, that we've ever had uh, has been, as, as you know, somebody's representing that sport in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. I've always been the believer, real quick, and you guys might disagree with me, but it, if it, when you have a Hall of Fame, whether it's a state Hall of Fame like that or it's Southeastern, if, if you got to sit around and have a debate, 
I don't even know if they're a Hall of Famer. I think Hall of Famers to me are just guys or girls that are just, uh, man, that there's no doubt that that person's all, if you got to sit there and really, you know, and so, you know, Cole Kelly's going to be one, I think that we'll have a chance to get in a football player that has done some great things uh, in their time. I think maybe Marlon Veal's got a chance down the line here. I'm talking about Southeastern at the Southeastern Hall of Fame. Um, just some of these new players that are going to come up soon. And I just think that, that it's it's so good to see you doing what you're doing uh, with the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame still today. And then, and then the Southeastern one, it, just, it means a lot to people like us that you're, you're so involved and, and it means a lot to you to make sure the right people are getting in and, 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 and their credit is being given to them for what they did here on campus. Well, thank you very much. Uh, try hard and see what we can do. And then of course on the, on the Southeastern Hall of Fame every year, and just like Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, every year a couple of new people become eligible, which pushes people that's been on the box for a couple of years. But it makes sense. They look at the Louisiana Hall of Fame this year. Drew Brees and Augustus went in unanimously. So, you know, uh, you're going to have one of those almost every year or two of those. And that's on a, that's on a statewide. Well, then that pushes some other people back that's been on the uh, ballot. Maybe a football player is almost ready. Well, then, then you can only – Go ahead, Mark. You there? No, I was just going to uh, say on, on Robert Alford, he, he's a Tom Brady comeback away from maybe having, you know, a better resume. I mean, because if Tom Brady yeah. doesn't lead a 28 to three comeback, he's the Super Bowl MVP. And I think that would have been a feather in his cap. And of course, his injuries his last three years, he basically missed, uh, you know, most, if not all, of three seasons. So that, that that's kind of put a dent in his uh, Louisiana Hall of Fame. But he'll, he'll be a no doubt, uh, you know, Southeastern Hall of Fame, no question. Yeah, no uh, for, for Robert and also, you know, Cole Kelly and, you know, some others, and we'll talk about those, but, uh, Larry, before we let you go, I do have to talk about this, uh, as I hold it up, I don't know if you can see it. Um, put it in front of your chest, Mark. Yeah, there we go. Right there. Okay. This I can't is, see. This is your book, Southeastern Lions Athletic History, written, written by Larry Heimel. I know this is a labor of love for you. And, uh, you put a lot of work and effort and time in this, and this, uh, has to be the go-to Bible for, uh, all things history of Southeastern athletics. Just talk about your book and uh, talk about uh, what spurred you to write it, how long it took, and uh, you know some interesting things you learned along the way that maybe you had forgotten. And also, where can people get it? Well, first of all, where well, you can get it, you can get it at Southeastern Bookstore or Bayou Bookseller downtown Hammond. That's two uh, retail outlets. And the uh, bookstore sells them at football games also, at uh, both in the stadium and in a little trailer plus the uh, plus the, uh, the regular bookstore. Uh, as far as the, the uh, actual the book, uh, it started out as a writing project. Nobody had ever done anything about, you know, they've done history of Southeastern, but nobody ever focused on athletics. So I just started out as a writing project. And I said, when I finish, I'm going to run it off and put it in the archive. Somebody can go up there. Well, the more I got into it, the more people said, well, you need to do a book. You need to do a book. Well, I didn't have any financial backers come and say, you need to do a book, but that's okay. But I went through with it. <laughs> <laughs> and as you, um, uh, as you said, Mark, there was so many things. I, the 1930s and 1940s was so interesting to me. 1930s, starting how we got football started, the first undefeated team under uh, Red Swanson, and then the, how Strawberry Stadium was built in just a very short amount of time, and it's still there today. And then moving to the, the 40s, uh, I, I was really amazed at how much Jim Corbett did as a student at Southeastern. He, uh, you know, he went on and got most of his famous athletic director at LSU. But what he did as a student, I still call him when I've talked to groups and, and talked about the book. I said, I think Corbett was the most dynamic student Southeastern ever had. He did so much uh, from the athletic side, publicity. Uh, he's the one that actually, as a student, proposed that we start a Southeastern Athletic Hall of Fame. And um, just so many things that he did, it touched on. It's just almost unbelievable. And then, you know, and he was in the early 40s, and we had an undefeated football team in 46. Uh, those were big things. And then, then, of course, you know, doing the history of what happened to football and how it was brought back, uh, that was another interesting thing. I was able to talk to Dr. Claus and Dr. Moffitt uh, and Dr. Crane uh, about, uh, you know, about bringing back football and the steps it took. Those things were very, very interesting to me. And if you like game accounts and who did what and, and everything, from 50s through the through the 90s it's it's all there the championships the game big games who did who did what in certain ball games and 
And I've even had some former students who bought the book tell me, you know, I wasn't involved in athletics, but I went to all the games and it's brought back so many memories to me. And it just, those kind of comments just made it worthwhile. I mean, it's, uh, it, it wasn't, I didn't get into it to make any money and I'm not, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's accomplishment and, and it was something I wanted to do and, and I, I, I finished it and it got done. Well, I know you talked about, awesome. you talked about technology changing and, you know, during your tenure really. And, uh, I know cause you know, computers became a, a thing in the, in the eighties, the internet became a thing in the nineties and, of course, technology just really ramped up. I know, uh, starting early mid nineties on with you know, stat keeping, you know, we talk about records and I know you were diligent, uh, probably as diligent as anybody keeping very accurate records, details, but as you know, over time, paper things written down on paper and especially when you have shuffling of administrations and things get pushed off in a corner in a book somewhere, things kind of, kind of disappear. And I know you and I've talked about this at length, uh, privately about, uh, documenting and maintaining that history, finding it and telling the story. I know your book really uh, does a great job of doing that. I know there's some other projects with video going way back. There's video archives of just sitting around in, in a dusty room somewhere that need to be brought to light. And I think people need to see those. And I know that's something I know you're, you're very passionate about as well. Yes. And it, it, it all comes down to the dollar sign, Mark, when it comes to getting those, uh, those game 16 millimeter tapes converted over to USB, you know, thing or to a disc or whatever. Uh, they're sitting there and believe it or not, and we've, you and I have talked about this. They've got to be done pretty soon because those, those films will not last forever. And these are some films that go back into the early sixties and, you know, and seventies. Uh, that's just history that you can't recall, vi uh, you know, uh, visual history. You can you recall it. Back. Right. You'll never get it back if, once it disappears. Right. So we're working on it. I've talked to Sam Hyde, who's in charge of the thing all the time, and ask him, have you have you gone to the president? Have you told him what we need to do? And, uh, you know, that's just that's just part of it. But, uh, yeah, you're right. It's a video history that we need to save. And, and a lot of schools don't have that. We've tried to search for film uh, on different sports, even as in the 70s, you know, and uh, trying to find some film uh, – on the women's basketball team, that national championship, you know, we went, we checked with Tech and we checked with LSU and they didn't have any film on file either. And uh, I think we've located a little bit somewhere. And uh, so we, we're working on that. Just just a project that going to try not let die if it's possible. Well, as you know, we've also talked about, you, you mentioned the 70s and women's basketball. I think that's a, that's a subject that's worthy of a documentary because it just the rise of women's basketball and uh, how everything got started and, and especially how it impacted the campus here. And uh, that's something we, we would lo love to tell. So any video anybody has or anybody wants to help donate, I know that's something that we, we're going to try to put together and, and get some type of project, you know, to save that old history. So uh, be on the lookout for that as we move forward. So if you're watching this uh, podcast, uh, we may be hitting you up. So <laughs> you talk about history. That was one thing that helped me tremendously because through the years in public information, they clipped all the area newspapers and put them in scrapbooks. You know, all these game accounts uh, or news accounts and separate scrapbooks between, between sports and news. And they just they just kept accumulating them. Uh, Mr. Raul Sanford was head of publications and he was my first boss here. And there was a secretary named uh, uh, Miss Whitley, Miss Ann Whitley. And she um, she she compiling the, the scrapbooks, you know, and then as they went through the years, uh, they just every I mean, not just the daily papers, they've got all the weekly papers that, are, that were around the area back in those days. And of course, those are diminishing now, but they clipped every sports story, every news story, uh, story and preserved those in scrapbooks and they preserved the scrapbooks. That was the godsend. I oh, mean, speaks. I didn't have oodles of uh, video to get information I needed. That was, you know, that I may still be working on if I had to do that. Well, speaking of a, of a scrap, if you look at my, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but my backdrop is ba basically one of your old stories in the Daily Star back in uh, no. probably 1960 or 61. Lions look strong in season opener written by Larry Heimel, crush uh, Corpus Christi, 26 nothing on slippery turf. So uh, one of your old articles I use in my backdrop here today. You talked about computers. I always joked that I was, I was SIDBC. And they said, what's that? I said, before computers. Because we, <laughs> we didn't have, um, you know, all the stats were done, uh, game stats were done by hand, football and, and uh, 
uh, basketball and we didn't have to fill out stats in baseball very often. And, uh, but you know, and still had a ball game. Now you write, press one button, it goes to a hundred people back in those days. If we wanted to get something to the newspaper and the game was over, we just picked up the phone and called it, you know, advocate pick you. And those are the major ones in daily star. We just picked up the phone. And- wow. Robbie? Well, Larry, that was great. Uh, a lot of great stuff. I learned a little bit today, and I think people watching this will learn as well. And um, your book's great. It's a good tell-tall history of the, this great department, and uh, and just I think I think I think sports in Hammond that can be tied back to this university and student athletes that played there. So our special guest this week, the the legend Larry Heimel, the uh, former Thank sports you. and preparation director at Southeastern Louisiana University. Thank you, Milton, for inviting me on. I've really enjoyed it. All right, welcome back. That was our interview segment this week. As always, it's brought to you by Gateway Ford and Punch Tool. I want to thank Larry Heimel, the uh, former sports inf- information director, and also wore, as you heard, a lot of hats around Southeastern's campus for for a long, long time. And um, you know, Mark, we've been knowing Larry for a long time. You know, we've had the pleasure of actually calling a couple games with Larry. You know, we've uh, I remember, um, you know, Larry, 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 Larry thinks he's bad luck because I remember Alan could make it to um Lamar to Lamar uh that one year I think that was in what 2015. 2016 or something 2015. like that and Larry rode over there with us and I did sideline and, and Larry it was did 16 yeah. he, did, he, did, he did a fantastic job uh and the Lions did lose that day but it wasn't because of Larry in the no. booth but he did a great job I think he's filled in for us one other time maybe along the way but um you know he knows the game he knows he knows uh he knows football. He knows basketball. He knows all the sports. You know, you, you watch that much over the course of your career, obviously covering it in the capacity of sports information. You, you, you learn a lot. And um, we've been knowing Larry for a long time. And uh, you know, he's, a, you, know, you know, look, when you have the gap like there was from 85 to, or I guess it was 86 to 19, 2003, you know, the Lions played other sports in that time. But you know as well as me, Mark, especially in this part of the country, people lose that connection with the universe. That's why football is so important to have. It, the connection is stronger for, for students when you have football, right or wrong. I just think that's the way it goes. So you have a lot of people that I think truthfully, ha, are we, we have a lot of new lion fans, if that makes sense. I think we've gained a large fan base, um, you know, because I think we have, I think, you know, we have about as good a fan base as, as anybody in the South and conference right now. We have a really good fan base in FCS football and, and uh, mid-major in the other sports, right? I mean, baseball is about as good as it gets in mid-major uh, crowds and things like that. But anyways, um, Larry's a guy, we have a lot of new line fans that, you know, really have kind of caught onto this program in the last, you know, 20 years when they brought football back, really the last 10 years. We've grown our fan base tremendously. And guys like Larry can tell the story of, of, of line athletics before, this um this new group of people because there's just not a lot of people that have a lot of stories in that gap right and and larry has stories from that gap and he has stories from before that and he can relay all that that's why his book is so cool and it really does um you know lay out the the long storied history of this university and you know you think about it you know um you know what, what he's been able to accomplish in his career is pretty special. Well, uh, Larry and I go, I go way back with Larry, uh, really high school, uh, when I first met him and I really got to know him early nineties. You know, as, as I came back to school after professional baseball and he was at the tail end of his, his, uh, tenure as SID, but, uh, we actually did radio together in baseball in the mid nineties. So we spent some time in the booth together back then. And, yeah, I've known Larry a long time. We we've shared a lot of stories. We've been on a lot of car rides, you know, going to games and um, sitting at basketball games, just talking, catching up on old times. And and you're right, uh, uh, Robbie. He's got such a wealth of knowledge about southeastern history. I mean, he is southeastern history. He wrote most of it, uh, honestly. Uh, you get you know, figures at SID for 28 years and in the formative years of of Southeastern athletics in terms of, uh, the transition from NAIA division two into division one. And, uh, he pretty much wrote those chapters and, and there was an extensive history before, uh, he was on board. He talked about Jim Corbett, uh, you know, in the early days. And of course they had football success in the forties and fifties, but, uh, he is that gap. He can bridge that gap. He can tell the stories. Uh, he basically still has relationships with the old, 
old, I don't want to say old, but the older Lion fans or, or Lion supporters who played football in the 50s and 60s who are who are still strong supporters to this day. And, and he can bridge that gap between, you know, that era to the new era. So uh, anytime he gets a chance to tell his story, and I'm glad he did. I'll, I'm so thankful that he got a chance, and I'll pull it up here again. It's um, so Southeastern Athletic uh, history, 70 years from uh, 1930 to 1999. So uh, basically up to 2000 and the 75-year uh, anniversary, he tells that story. And uh, and really, that's the de- that's the era which media was not as prevalent as this day. You could click on the internet now and find just about any game story you want from you know 2003 on. You can find video. You can find a lot of that. But the older history, you know, from pre, you know, from 1999 before, a lot of that's lost. And you know, we talked about it, you know, in the interview that a lot of it's sitting in a, in a closet in the university center. There is tons of video in there, old reel to reel football videos from the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, uh, old basketball, uh, VHS tapes that are just sitting there. Trophies, trophies, um, uh, all kinds of, you know, knickknacks that are just stored away in a dark closet that need to be brought out. We we've talked about trying to find some way to, to, uh, you know, it's going to be a labor of love and it's going to take some donations and some, some money, but we want to try to get that out. Where's, get the, the, where's the women's national championship trophy? Well, is you've that, got, you know, that, that's in the hall of champions. You still, you have a lot of that stuff okay. there, but, but a lot of, a lot of the older, uh, you know, trophies, uh, certificates, uh, just, it just really any kind of history was, was just vanished. I mean, you got to realize you dropped football in 1985. You had to drop basketball two years later for a year you were not in a conference. Uh, you were Division One with no football, no basketball. Uh, y- your athletic program was hanging by a thread, and that, and that's a true story uh, because you know it was during the, that wave of budget cuts in the '80s, and it really took until the mid '90s to see that turnaround. Tom Dupel was hired from LSU, came in in '92, kind of got uh, Southeastern on sound footing, got uh, or uh, Southeastern into the Trans-America Athletic Conference, which is now the ASUN, and then eventually into the Southland Conference. And, and he tried to get football back on his watch. He just uh, wasn't able to get done. But uh, Sally, Sally Clausen took over. And, you know, in 2000, there was a big impetus and a fundraiser to get football back. And in 2002, it was finally restored. And, you know, since that time, I think there's a lot of Southeastern fans who – aren't aware of that era. You know, they're younger, younger uh, fans and, and students that really don't know how tough times were uh, back in those days. And they only see what, what's happening now. And that's all they have to go on. So if you know where yeah. the program was and to where it is now, I, I don't think you would complain very much. Uh, it is leaps and bounds uh, ahead and it, it still has a lot of room to grow and it will grow. And, you know, I, you know, people like us that, want to tell the story with this podcast and, and guys like Larry. So I'm, I'm glad we had him on. And um, again, you can, you can pick up his book in the bookstore, buy your booksellers uh, at strawberry stadium on Saturday at the game. You can find a copy and, and, and buy it because it's full wealth of uh, knowledge on Southeastern sports. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to ask Larry and I didn't get a chance to ask him, but I'd love to ask Larry, like if you put him back in 1980 and you'd say, look um, in, in, in the two thousands or whatever, men's ba- uh, baseball will be will make the NCAA tournament two different occasions as an at-large not winning the league just as an at-large um the men's basketball term team will win this will win the conference and go to the NCAA tournament because you remember back in 1980 the tournament was a lot smaller back then you know and uh you know in, in 2005 they, they're gonna go to the NCAA tournament southeastern football will will make strides and play in a quarterfinal Going back to 2013, they played in a national quarterfinal game against New Hampshire. They've they've been to the second round on a number of occasions over the last, you know, handful of years. Could he have imagined that? You know, where where they sat at the time. And look, the landscape's way different today. Um, but you know, if you're 19, I mean, I I, I can't get in those I, shoes. But could, could I, he have I was imagined around that? then. I I would tell yeah. you if you t- if you say 1980, I would tell you yes, we could have imagined it. Uh, 1985 to 86, 87, that era, I would say no. Uh, be, because I would just tell you the bottom dropped out of the program. You got to realize in 1980, Southeastern was moving into Division One. 
got a big upset win at Boise State. That was uh, kind of probably the signature win of this athletic program in the history of Southeastern. That and Auburn in 1950 and Southern Miss in 54. And until you get into, you know, playoff win against uh, Sam Houston, Villanova, uh, wins like that. But before, before the dropping Idaho. of football at Idaho and before 1985, that Boise State win because, you know, they went on to win a national championship in that season. So uh, you beat the national champion, you went eight and two, and things were looking pretty good. Basketball was, you know, uh, Ken Fortenberry had good programs in 1982, went 18 and nine. A couple of years later, Newton Chalette were 18 and nine. And then all of a sudden, 1984, 85, 86, uh, you started to see the, the cliff. And of course, dropped football. He had two bad years, 1983, 84, really three bad, uh, 84 and 85 in football. And then, uh, you know, Jay Larry Crane's the president and he decided to, to drop the program. And from that moment on, it looked like a free fall. And then basketball two years later had some issues and uh, dropped the program for one year. You're in no conference. You were in the old Gulf States Conference, um, which was Sam Houston, Texas State, uh, Northwestern, Nichols. And of course, with no football, that conference fell apart. So uh, and Tom Dupel comes along, gets Southeastern into the Trans America Athletic Conference, which was non football because none of the programs had football at that time, but at least introduced some stability into the program. And uh, baseball uh, had some success in the mid 80s under John Stevenson, but again, no conference. And uh, it wasn't until the early 90s when Greg Martin took over that. Uh, you started to see baseball take off, but uh, women's basketballs had some sporadic success. But, but, but yeah, to go back to your question in 1980, I would say, yeah, you probably could see it. 1985, I would definitely not. Uh, but, you know, there's been, just been so much progress since then. And, and I'm just glad Larry's been around to see that evolution and, and also to be able to tell the stories. I mean, the city of Hammond, I mean, there's no doubt that the, that, that the two are linked. Um, the growth I mean, obviously, the growth of the North Shore is way more broad than Southeastern Athletics or Southeastern Louisiana University. But the growth of the city of Hammond and basically the southern half of Tangipo Parish, its explosion in growth in the last 10 years, a lot of that's tied to the university. And the university's growth is tied to the growth of the, of the community and the success of the of the downtown development district. I mean, that that, that I mean. And you can talk about that, Mark, being around. And there's a lot of people watching this podcast, I'm sure, that can remember, uh -huh. you know, what downtown Hammond looked like in the late 80s and 90s and what it looks like today. That's all part of getting recruits here, uh, making your programs better. Um, all of that is tied together. And there were times where it was tougher, you know, uh, uh, you know, to sell the product of, of the city of Hammond. At the time football was dropped, I would just tell you, Hammond, downtown Hammond was a borderline ghost town. It was uh, boarded up. It, you had a lot of broken, rundown buildings, dilapidation, uh, blight. Um, uh, and there were some nicer, I mean, again, you had some business there, but it was more kind of mom and pop stores. Um, you know, your typical daily retail outlets uh, it wasn't, uh, but the, you know, what you see now, boutique shops, restaurants, none of that really existed. You didn't have a, an anchor restaurant in downtown Hammond at that point. Uh, everything kind of moved out toward the interstate, toward the mall, uh, the old Hammond Square Mall before when it was inside. Um, and then it was, you know, they had a renewal around 96, 97. Of course, PJ Coffee, came, PJs came in, in the early 90s, kind of set up shop, never left. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, there was a little place right by the railroad track, right by the, the post office that was always something. Uh, it was, you know, it was a cell phone shop. It was a Mexican restaurant, a donut shop. And then here comes a new Mexican restaurant called La Coretta. And all of a sudden things started to pop back in. Uh, uh, the Columbia theater was renovated by Southeastern. All of a sudden you started to have some cultural activity come in. And, and the, of course, all that coincided with the reemergence of football coming out of the late nineties into the early two thousands. And I think it all tied in hand to hand, hand in hand. And now you're starting to see the farmer's market grow and, and take off. And downtown Hammond is, I, I got to tell you, Robbie, I know you live in Slidell. We try to get you to move to Hammond, but uh, uh, it's, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to shop. It's a great place to go out and eat. It's a great place to, to raise a family. And, and uh, I, I love living here and I, I've been here, you know, pretty much my entire adult life and uh, wouldn't move for anywhere else. So 
Uh, but I do think Southeastern athletics has, has played a big part in that, even though, you know, this is a, a dual town. You got a lot of LSU fans, but I tell you what, you go out on Saturdays here in the last uh, couple of years, it's green and gold everywhere on Saturday night. Oh yeah. I, that, that's a, that's a true statement for sure. Um, you know, with the proximity to downtown of the university, you know, everything about it. And, and that just ties into uh, guys like Larry that, um, can tell the story about where we've come from. It's important. So I want to thank him again. We could talk forever on Larry and, and what he's done for, uh, for this university. And we'll probably have him on again at some point down the oh, road. Yeah. Mark, Mark, tell me, um, give me your, obviously the eighties was the worst, but if you had to give me a, 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 a the best decade of line athletics since 1930, what, what would you say it, it is? Since 1930. All around sport. I mean, you know, again, I I'm, you know, you got to realize I've only lived here since the late seventies, but yeah, Larry's probably been the one to ask that question. But, but going through Southeastern history, if you look at, you know, the heyday and, and that sort of thing, I would say the fifties was a strong decade. I would say the early sixties uh, was strong. You know, the fifties, of course you had 1954, which is the greatest season in Southeastern football history. You had good basketball success in men's basketball. Of course, women's athletics didn't exist then. So it's hard to, say it's the fifties without women's athletics being tied in. Um, the early eighties were, were pretty good. Uh, then of course you had the seventies and women's basketball and a national championship and you had success in football. You had Billy Brewer, uh, 1976, he got things turned around, took over in 74 and, uh, got, you know, had a couple of, uh, building seasons, 1976, uh, things really took off he was here for six years. He led Southeastern into division one before he left for Louisiana Tech. Oscar Lawton takes over, and in 1980, he had the, the great season then. Basketball had some success. So uh, looking back at it, I would say that those were some good times. But overall, I would have to say, you know, the decade, you know, 2010 to 2020 is probably the most successful athletically. I mean, you have uh, great football success. You've got four regionals in baseball under uh, two coaches, J.R. Teagues and, and Matt Reiser. Um, leading the charge there. Of course, Greg Martin had a couple of regionals in the 90s. But, you know, baseball really solidified itself as a, a top 100, top 75 uh, power in the United States in Division One baseball. And they've kind of stayed there, uh, give or take. I mean, you had a couple of down years here recently. But uh, the program's in, in good shape now with Bobby Barbier. Uh, men's basketball's had some success. Women's basketball's won tournaments. Uh, uh, every sport has had its day. In that day, in this past decade, you know, now we've started on another decade, but, um, you know, looking back on it objectively, I'd say 2010 to 2019, 20. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great way to look at it. And, um, you know, you've, you've had these right people come along at the right time to help these programs out. But, uh, Mark, um, some news this week, uh, men's basketball has been practicing. We're going to be getting some stuff with uh, coach Kiefer here soon and, and coach Gazzardo. Uh, some video uh, of them, which will be out on Twitter and stuff like that uh, over the next week or two. So we'll be looking for that as it comes out. But um, uh, basketball schedule is going to be pretty good one. They got some great games, got some local games that uh, people obviously can check out in the non-conference university center games. But uh, there's also some games out there that uh, are not too far away. Obviously two trips to Baton Rouge within about a seven day time span, uh, traveling to play Southern and LSU, Louisiana Tech down the road it's on a tough trip to uh, to make it to. So there's some chances for for line fans to see this team uh, before they get into the new year in 2024, playing the Southland Conference slate. And, um, you know, talk, talking to Coach Kiefer, what I've talked to him, um, you know, looking a little bit at the at the kids that we've, we've brought in, this may be one of the better teams that the Lions have had, uh, you know, going back to Jay Ladner's team at the Marlinville where they were, you know, seconds away from, you know, winning the uh, winning the Southland Conference in uh, what was that, two thousand and seventeen? I want to say two thousand seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So th this is a good group, and they're going to have a good season. Talk about the schedule a little bit, Mark. Well, it all starts Monday night. Delta State comes to town. I'll have that game on the uh, Southeastern Radio Network. I'll be doing that game on Monday, and that's going to be a great chance to 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 introduce yourself to this basketball team. Students will be in town, so it's, it's a Monday night. So that's not going to be excused. I know they have some promotions going on. It's got you, you get a chance to see a good basketball team. This is a team that went to Bahamas uh, back in August, so they've been together already. Had a chance to practice for ten days 
uh, back then, play three games against outside competition. They played very well, won three games. Uh, I think one of them was close, but uh, scored over 120 points in all three ball games, or over 100 points, and averaged up close to 120 points. Uh, this is a deep basketball team. Uh, this is a team that I would venture to say probably, you know, it's hard for, you know, a Division One basketball team to play more than nine guys just because you get too many cooks in the kitchen. But I do believe there's probably 12 uh, players on this roster, maybe 13 that are capable of contributing on a Division One Southland Conference roster and, and, and on a winning team. And, uh, of course, it's going to have to sort itself out on who, you know, those eight or nine that are going to be the guys night in and night out. They'll they'll play 10, 11 guys, but, you know, the core. And, of course, you got a lot of guys back. Roger McFarland's a player of the year candidate. Uh, Nick Caldwell's been here forever. He's back again for his senior year. Roscoe Eastman's back. Um, you know, Brody Roberry was a, fr a freshman. It kind of, I wouldn't say come out of nowhere, but I think he's a guy that surprised a lot of people last year with his ability to impact right away. I thought he hit a wall field. last year a little bit at the end of the year. So Had some injuries, he, yeah. I think, yeah, I think his second year is going to have that stamina built up to play um, that entire season. So I'm excited to watch him. Yeah, he's but I, you know, again, he's lost some weight, and I know he's a, a young man that's battled some weight issues, and he's been up over 300 pounds, and I, I think he's down under, you know, at, at a reasonable weight now, and he played well in the, in the uh, you know, the Bahama tournament trip, and. Uh, really played well in that uh, in that trip. Of course, Avery Wilson, that's a, a young man we didn't talk about last week, who's back and finally going to get on the floor at Southeastern. He has missed four consecutive years either due to a red shirt. And he's had three injury years in a row in which uh, I think he's torn his ACL twice. And uh, he's just <laughs> had some bad luck, and he's finally healthy. He's a transfer from Boston College. He, he, I, I'm not sure if he'll get another year uh, by the NCAA. I think so far they've denied it, but – I know he's applied for this year and next year, even though he's in year number seven uh, post high school, but he's a uh, dynamic. He's a, a very strong athletic young man who can score the basketball, get up down the floor and defend. So he's going to bring some, you know, a different type of punch to this lineup. We talked about McFarland. He's a kind of a do it all. He can rebound, shoot, score, uh, defend. He can do it all. Roscoe Eastman will run the point. Uh, yet Chino Paez out of Austin P is a transfer. Uh, who was a starter at Austin P at point guard. He'll come in and bring some veteran leadership. Dylan Canneville is a young man who uh, was a uh, JUCO All-American uh, player of the year in the Mississippi Junior College ranks, uh, averaged a double-double last year. And then our true freshman, Cameron Burton, is a guy that I'm really excited to see. He, he missed the first game down in the Bahamas, but uh, the last two games really played well. He's a bouncy 6'3", a uh, true freshman out of Houston who can score, can defend. He's got some, uh, you know, size to him, some physicality, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him as well. So it's going to be a good team, and I think, you know, again, it's going to be a tough league. McNeese is going to be good. You know, I think UIW is going to surprise some people. Nichols is going to be right there. And, of course, always con uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. So uh, it's going to be a competitive league, and I think Southeastern, you know, pick to win it will be right there. Absolutely. Um Another note: Baseball uh, got their schedule out um, for the you know for the start this year. Good spread of some great home games. Uh, we finally get the Bison to come to town. They're yeah. bigger for baseball, not for football. <laughs> North Dakota State will be in town in uh, February, but um, LSU coming back to uh, to Alumni Field, which is going to be great. And I know uh, uh, Coach Coach Barbier brought the team to Biloxi this past uh, Sunday to play Sanford. They got a win over there. It looked pretty good. Um, I think that's a great thing the NCAA is doing, Mark. I know you're, you're a baseball guy. Follow it closely. I think that's great that the NCAA is allowing these teams to have these games in the fall to help themselves. Well, and, and NCAA used to allow this back in the 80s. I mean, this was a common practice. Now, most Division One teams would play junior colleges, but you always were able to play outside competition. They did away with it. Uh, early nineties went away from playing outside competition. You can always do it, but it counted against your 56 game schedule. And it wasn't until the recent, you know, past and maybe the last 10 years, you started to see some teams give up a couple of uh, spring games because of the weather in the South is, is you never know if you can get rain out. So what they were doing was, you know, trying to play a couple of outside games in the fall, count them against your spring schedule, just play 54. And, and finally, just decided to go ahead and let it ha let it happen because baseball has become so popular, you know, especially in this part of the world that you know you can sell it. You can sell spring baseball. It's a, it's good for your fan base. It's good to grow the sport, 
and it's good for development for your young players. So I, I think it's a no brainer. It's not like football where you're crashing heads and, and injuries can pop up, but you talk about the schedule. I love it, Robbie. It's, uh, you know, there's six non division or, or, you know, six games against some RPI, tough RPI games, a couple of non uh, division one schools in there, but overall the schedule lays out great. Uh, you got Tarleton state at home. You talked about uh, UAB on the road. That's going to be a good road series, a winnable road series against the conference USA opponents, well coached. Um, you've got uh, three games at East Carolina. That's got a chance to American, build your all right. Yeah, they're very UAB good. Uh, what's that? I'm sorry. Isn't UAB American now? Uh, UA or American. Yeah, they mo just moved to the American, I should say. You're right about that, as is East Carolina, who's uh, a top 25 perennial program and uh, always on the cusp of going to the College World Series. Cliff Godwin does a great job there. So that'll be an opportunity for Southeastern to go on the road, maybe build their RPI if they could get a win or two uh, against a very good opponent. And then uh, the thing that I really like that I, I asked Damon Sunday earlier today, when's the last time Southeastern has played LSU, Tulane, uh, ULL, uh, Southern Miss, and South Alabama all in the same year, home and home. And you got to go back to 1987 uh, to find the last time Southeastern has done that. So it's a very attractive schedule. Anytime you can get the defending national champions uh, in your backyard, along with uh, uh, your traditional rivals, Tulane, ULL, Southern Miss, and South Alabama, and you get a chance to, to go on the road. And, and again, the way the RPI works, you know, road wins are huge. So if you can go on the road and win one of those ball games, that'll give you a chance to build an RPI base. But uh, North Dakota State comes in, as you mentioned. St. Louis is a, a program that for years was kind of dormant, but they've been better as of late. They'll come to the Pat for three games in March. Uh, that's a good series there. And then you get in conference play, you know, Northwestern State, HCU, Nichols, uh, Lamar, and uh, McNeese. You know, very good programs, UNO and – UIW and Corpus. So that'll, that'll round out the schedule. I think it's a very attractive schedule and one that, you know, I think Bobby Barbier coming in, uh, they played this weekend over at, uh, in Biloxi against Sanford, uh, had an ex successful 14 innings uh, against a good program in Sanford out of the so Southern Conference. So, um, you know, I think they got a chance to translate that in the spring and have a very good year. Well, that, that sums it up for sure. I'm excited to watch it as I am basketball. Real quickly, Mark, uh, McNeese comes to town for Hall of Fame week, uh, weekend, as uh, honor some more guys going into the Hall of Fame, guys and girls going into the Hall of Fame in Southeastern. Cowboys come to town, uh, obviously winless on the season. Their game last week against Northwestern was canceled. So they're kind of on another bye week. And so Southeastern was thinking they were going to have the up on somebody having to play them after a bye week and they played last week. That wasn't the case. Northwestern uh, lost that game. Um, I think they, I think I was told that they lost it like Thursday afternoon. Like that was when they were notified. So they, they, they prepared basically all week for Northwestern state and then the Northwestern state, which is a total calamity up there. You hate, you know, obviously the death of the young man is terrible, but how this is all played out with, um, you know, the, the university canceling the season saying their players were traumatized and, didn't want to play to basically the whole team coming out and saying, no, no, we wanted to play. This was a university decision and uh, it's become a mess. And McNeese was tied up in it last week. That was their homecoming. You hate that for, for those seniors at McNeese that won't get to play homecoming this year, because uh, obviously they might be able to move that to one of their games. Um, you know, later in the year, remember Southeastern had to do that in 2017 with a hurricane. UIW was supposed to be the hurricane game. They had to move homecoming into later in the year, but that was an earlier game in the season. You have more time right now. You've only got, you know, you've only got two more weeks left after this week. So um, it's going to be tough for them to try to figure that out. But uh, Hey, the Cowboys uh, always dangerous. They always match up against Southeastern. This team was one in six last year when the Lions traveled to Lake Charles and the Lions had to pull, pull it out at the last minute and, uh, and win that football game over there in Lake Charles. So anything can happen in these games. They're going to have to play good on Saturday. Well, it's Southeastern McNeese. I mean, it, it is what it is. It doesn't matter, if, you know, Southeastern's one and seven, McNeese 0 and seven, or I guess, I guess technically they're one and seven, or I think technically they're one and three in conference play and 0 and seven uh, on the season. Yeah. Cause I think the NCAA doesn't count the win. So, uh, but even though the Southland Conference counts the forfeit. So, uh, McNeese will be looking for their first win on the field as, as Southeastern was uh, a couple of weeks ago at Northwestern State. But, you know, you throw the record books out when these two get together. And, and again, this is a, you know, Nichols, you know, we talk, yeah, I know you asked Larry on the interview, you know, who our biggest rival is. And I think we all 
pretty much agree it's Nichols, but you know, McNeese has really developed into a good rivalry, you know, since we brought football back. And I, I think we have a 11 to 10 advantage uh, against them since football's uh, returned. We won four in a row. So, um, you know, they're going to be looking to break that streak. Almost did it last year. You know, uh, we had the stage of comeback to uh, pull that victory out. Almost could have wrecked our season last year. And that was a McNeese team that was struggling coming in. And, you know, so they're always going to – they're always talented. They have a good recruiting base. Uh, they always have talent. They have talent now. A lot of it's youth. Uh, a lot of new roster turnover. I think they have like 30 players or 34, I believe, uh, back from last year. So and they have a ton of injuries all year and and uh, just got off like kind of like like us. You know, got off on a bad start and you know, kind of snowballed. Next thing you know, you look up and you're you're 0 and 7. Uh, that's kind of where they found themselves. But they played well against UIW the last time out. They led that game. I think it was 21 7 or 23, whatever it was at halftime. 24 yeah, 7. 24 7. And then uh, UIW came back in the second half, changed quarterbacks and kind of opened things up. But, you know, again, for McNeese to, to have a 24 7 lead at halftime against, you know, UIW is probably the odds on favor to win the league. Tells you that McNeese has some, some talent. They're well coached. Gary Goff, we know him. Uh, used to be a you know coach here under Hal Mummy. And, you know, so he'll have his team ready. And it's, um, you know, three o'clock kickoff in Strawberry Stadium. And, going to need all the fans to come out and and you know we talk about this season you're 0 and 7 or 1 and 7 what do you have to play for and there's a lot to play for you've got guys uh, playing for you know the future young players trying to solidify who they are going into the next year you know you know, hope this is an aberration you know coaching staff uh you know and again I know Frank Selfo's talked about it at nauseum but you know this team was also close to to being in the hunt um, you know, go back and look at all the one score losses, all the turnovers, the penalties, uh, the, the five or six plays here and there that could have flipped the script on this season. And we're talking about maybe, you know, looking at a playoff uh, chase here going down the stretch, but it's not to be. So now you're, you're playing for next year. You're playing for, uh, you know, basically pride. You're playing to, you know, get some momentum going into 2024. Yeah, and that's that's the uh, the calling card of this team. With with three games left, you have two in state rivals, and if you um, if you beat Nichols at the end of the year, and you beat McNeese, hopefully you beat Commerce in the middle. You can still sweep the state of Louisiana, which is something Southeastern has been able to accomplish. Now it'd be uh, two straight years getting a chance to do that, beating McNeese, Nichols, and Northwestern in the same season. So they're going to have to play good. They're going to have to play uh, their kind of game. And look, if 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 um, if if it's inconvenient, if it's hard for you to get to Strawberry Stadium on a weeknight, this is your last chance to see the Lions until next year on a Saturday game. Obviously, they have one more home game, but it's a Thursday night in two weeks. Um, and then uh, you have Commerce on the road in the middle. So if you, if you want to see the Lions one more time this year and see these seniors, a lot of good players that won a lot of games here uh, who, will, who will be honored, obviously, at the Nickel State game at the end of the season. But guys that have Southland Conference rings, played in some big playoff games in their time at Hammond, um, you want to see them play one more time when you really can't get to the Nichols game on a Thursday night. This is the one to get to. And also, uh, you know, Isaiah Corbett and Xavier Roberson being inducted to the Hall of Fame. So, you know, along Sam Bowie and um, I'll have to pull up the Hall of Fame list. It escapes me off the top of my head, but uh, we'll try to get those announcements out here before we sign off. But, you know, it's Hall of Fame uh, recognition day. And we used to do a separate Hall of Fame day. We'd bring them into an official uh, ceremony at halftime. Of course, that ceremony has been pushed up to august and so that banquet uh, they were awarded gold jerseys got got inducted back in august but uh you know they're going to be recognized uh on saturday so if you you know you were around here in 2013 and 14 and had a chance to see isaiah and uh xavier play on those two championship teams going out and uh, applaud when their names are announced at, at halftime or during the game but um, they deserve it. For sure. no, no, no question about it, as do all the inductees, uh, for sure. But, um, you know, again, you look up and, you know, we're, you know, what, week nine of football season? This will be the ninth game of the yep. season? I mean, where's the time gone? Yep. I mean, it's unbelievable. You look up and here we are. You know, it seems like we just kicked off in Starkville. Yeah, that's the way it seems to always go. And, you know, it's November 1st, uh, you know, when this pod comes out today, so. Uh, two months left in the calendar year. A lot of excitement still to come in line athletics. Um, you hope football can finish off on a good note, finishing four and seven, and carrying that into the off season as we go. And um, 
You know, uh, I was actually watching some old video today of um, the Nickel State game against Southeastern last year and the, and the McNeese game of last year. And, you know, I know Coach Self was going to say there's no excuses, but, you know, and, and the Lions should have beaten some teams they played. But, man, you, you really forget the amount of players that we lost from, from last year's team and in, 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 in last year in general. I mean, guys offensively, I mean – both your stud running backs are gone. Your center, Cephas Johnson played so good last year. Um, Nick Kovacs, Terrell Carter is a guy people forget about. Um, you know, obviously C.J. Turner was was a part of the team. Gage is gone. Um, uh, Chris uh, Michael Spurlock. I mean, you yeah. know, great players that are just not part of the team this year, and um, it just makes you think, like, like, man, you know, look, we we probably should be better than one in seven. I know the coaching staff believes that we have good players. We've replaced those guys with good players. It just hasn't worked. But man, when you when you have to replace so many guys, it just it makes you sit back and think for a second. Like, man, you know, maybe we need to, need to give it one more year and see what happens because we lost a lot of key contributors from last year's team. No, I agree with that, Robbie. No, no question about it. It's like a, you know, you do a recipe, you build, bake a cake, or you know, cook a cook a meal and. Yeah, you, know, you have ingredients, right? And you can have. I'm mean, talking about defense guys too, Mark. I didn't mention right. those defense. Well, yeah, guys. I mean, but we'll talk about it. But you know, you, you can you can have a meal plan. And you have in, ingredients taken by themselves are all great. But if you put a little too much of one thing, not enough of this, you know, together, next thing you know, it doesn't taste quite right. And I think this year is maybe a little bit of that. And I I, I do agree. This team should be better. Uh, and it certainly shouldn't be one and seven. Uh, no, I don't think anybody. Uh, believes that now have they executed uh, in such a way that yeah they are one and seven yeah I mean they turned the ball over and you know you've had penalties you've had inopportune I mean you've had a lot of mistakes um, in, right. in close games that have cost you games but if you don't make those mistakes with the same players you know we're sitting here talking about the playoffs or p potentially uh, making the playoffs and in the, in the line is that fine so yeah you can say that yeah, we lost this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and that's the reason. But I, I would just tell you, there's enough here on campus right now that if you can just keep them, you know, that's, of course, we haven't even talked about that yet, but, you know, with the transfer portal coming up. But, you know, one thing I was going to mention earlier, you talked about it. Um, you know, one thing I did see was encouraging is a, 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 a commitment, a previous commitment from East St. John uh, to Kai Joseph, very explosive wide receiver at East St. John had committed and then kind of, you know, I think kind of backtracked from that commitment during the middle of the season. He recommitted yesterday. So he's back on board. So that tells you a lot about what's going on recruiting wise and, 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 and the buy-in with recruits. And hopefully that spills over, you know, to the, to the roster. It's already here, but, you know, again, I think there's enough here that if you can just add to it, get the right piece, uh, you know, maybe get a veteran or two out of the portal, maybe the junior college ranks that you can add to it. And just flip the mindset going into the next year. I think this team can rebound and rebound well. I mean, the, the, the schedule next year is going to be difficult, just like it was this year early on. But let's let's face it, this league's not tough. Uh, it's not it's not a, a great league right now. Now it could change on a dime, yeah. but uh, I'll be honest with you, it's 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 a disappointment that we're sitting here at the bottom of the standings, looking up at a league, league that this this team should win every year. And that's kind of where we are. And uh, but I, that that script can change next year. It's it's doable. No doubt. Well, Mark, uh, we'll see you in the stadium on Saturday, getting getting after it uh, with another game, another another one of your uh, chances to call the Big East Southeastern rivalry. You've done a lot of them over the years, and always uh, fun. Be great football. No uh, doubt about it. So uh, yeah, looking next forward. Week to we'll have uh, yeah, next week we'll have a little bit more. Um, working on a couple of different guests for next week. We'll see what we can pull together, but we'll announce all that information. And just so you know, we're going to do a lot of content. Um, it may be separate podcasts. I don't know, but we're going to do, you know, get into basketball, men and women, uh, some minor sports, obviously baseball coming up uh, in the spring as well. So we're going to try to hit all those. Uh, it's going to, you know, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it. We're going to try to bring a lot of uh, outside of the department content, you know, that, is generated outside of the department because, you know, we can. So uh, we've got the format to do it. We're going to do it, and uh, we have fun doing it. So try to no bring, you, you know, bring you guests and every week and 
Uh, something new, something some, exciting. Yeah, something new. Have some fun. No doubt. Well, Mark, great job as always. I want to thank our sponsor, Gateway Ford, for interview segment. I want to thank Larry Hamel, who was our interview this week, former SID and Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame member and also Southeastern Sports Hall of Fame member who uh, did so much and gave so much for this university. I want to thank him for coming on. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being with us. Lions play McNeese on Saturday. we got volleyball as well this week, um, soccer, um, basketball's tipping it off here soon. A lot of stuff, a lot of exciting stuff going on on campus, so check it out. And you can follow along on Twitter as always and YouTube for uh, all the cool stuff coming out about Southeastern Athletics through us. And we'll be with you next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Mark, great job. We'll talk to you next week, my friend. Line up and peace. Line up. All right, that's it. That's the Southeast Sport Network podcast. See you next week, guys.